Hey everyone, I want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study for May the 18th, 2022. And uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to open up to the book of Daniel chapter 10. Tonight we're going to be again uh, looking at, at sort of a, uh, a two-part series here, I guess, right in the middle of Daniel. Uh, Daniel has a vision here. Uh, tonight we're going to look at the uh, uh, beginning in chapter 10 of this, the, the visitation of this angel. We're going to talk about the appearance uh, of this angel and who it might be and and uh, and this kind of a introduction. And then next week, we're going to look at the actual, um, uh, begin to look at the actual prophecy in chapter 11. I might have to split that. That goes all the way to the end of chapter 12. I might actually have to split it up and make this a three-part series instead of a two-part series. But uh, nevertheless, we're going to continue to work through the book of Daniel. Tonight, we will be in Daniel chapter 10. I uh, want to remind you, if you have any prayer requests, please put them in the reply section so that we would have a record of them. Uh, I always like to go back after and look. If there's any prayer requests there, lift them up in prayer. If you've got any praises, be sure to put them in. I want to remind you that this week at church, uh, on the, uh, this Sunday, oh, we are going to be having a very special Heritage Sunday. Now, we're moving it up a week, um, and that is to kind of avoid the um, uh, Memorial Day week weekend plus Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we're going to be actually getting our daughter taken up to uh, Pittsburgh where she's going to be working with Jensen throughout the summer. And so uh, I won't be here on the 28th. But um, so we moved everything over to this week and uh, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful worship service. I know Adrian's putting together a very special service for us. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper. Uh, we are going to be uh, recognizing uh, some folks that have served very uh, diligently in our church. We're going to preach the gospel. It's going to be a wonderful day. And then we're going to have our barbecue cook-off. If you uh, uh, want to help with this, we, we, we want you to enter it in. We're going to be crowning uh, the, uh, 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 I think the way it was worded was the uh, pork king and queen or princes and prince. And uh, we're going to give out an award for who's made the best barbecue. And so if you've got a barbecue recipe, we want you to make it. I know we've already got some folks that have signed up to bring riblets and ribs and uh, pulled pork. And I think I'm going to make some pulled pork for it. Um, if you can uh, smoke uh, or make barbecue, uh, make your favorite and bring it. Uh, and enter it into the contest. Also, we want to encourage you to bring some sides and some desserts. The church will provide everything else. Uh, but this is kind of a, a little bit of a potluck kind of a dinner. So please make sure that you bring stuff so that we'll have plenty. And then we're going to eat, get fat and happy and excited and, and uh, have a, a wonderful, wonderful day in worshiping the Lord. And so this would be a great Sunday to invite a friend to come and be with you and say, hey, we're going to even provide lunch for you after to church and and make sure you stick around because one of the things been lacking for the last three years in our church with all this COVID stuff has been fellowship. And we're planning a lot more fellowship activities uh, throughout this summer and fall. And I uh, want to encourage you to make sure that you're there and a part of that. Uh, also continue, uh, of course, uh, being much in prayer. We we uh, prayed over a lot of the folks who will be going out on missions activities uh, this summer. We've got others that will be serving uh, in uh, uh, in Chicago. Uh, we've got mission foreign mission trips that are planned. We've got a vacation Bible school coming up. And that may not sound like that's a missions endeavor, but it really is. We're reaching our local community with that. And I'm very excited to say that this is the first time this has ever happened. And I've been pastoring for over 25 years. And uh, this is the first time it's ever happened that we have all of our vacation Bible school uh, workers signed up and ready to go. Now, that doesn't mean there's more, more room. If you'd like to sign up, I'm, I promise you, Clarissa, so we'll find a spot for you. We'll get you plugged in, and uh, it's going to be a wonderful time, and uh, we're going to have a great, great, great um, uh, time uh, in Vacation Bible School later on this summer. So uh, please be praying about that and getting ready for it. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord, have a word of prayer, and then we will get started into our Bible study. 
Father, we thank you for this day and the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the beautiful weather that we've had here lately, Father. We thank you for all of the provisions that you've provided for us. Lord, uh, I want to especially praise you for the way you've been moving in our worship services, Father. And uh, Lord, the, the, the people that have joined our church here recently, given their life to the Lord, uh, those that uh, are, have just gone through our new members class. And Lord, we pray for those that are still considering whether they want to join and be a member. Lord, we ask that you'd watch over them. And we want, uh, we, of course, we want them to be a part of our church, but Lord, most of all, we want them to be serving where you want them to be, Lord. We pray for those that will be going out on mission trips and missions activities throughout the summer. We pray for those that are sick and afflicted, Lord, and we lift them up. We pray that your hand would be upon them. Watch over them and guide them. I pray that you would speak to us now through your word as we look here at this incredible chapter in the book of Daniel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, open your Bibles up to the book of Daniel, chapter 10. And in Daniel, uh, in chapter 10, actually all the way through chapter 12, Daniel has an incredible vision. And I want to show you here in the first three verses sort of the occasion for this and the setting for it so we can kind of get it under hand here. This is in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. A word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar, and the word was true, and it was great, and it was a great conflict, and he understood the word and had an understand had understanding of the vision. Now you'll notice here we're given the timing of when David or Daniel receives this great vision. It was during the third year of King Cyrus, which would have put it in about 536 or 535 BC, somewhere right in there. This would have about would have occurred about two years after the vision that Daniel received in Daniel chapter 9. So if you're, you're thinking about about two years have gone by, and this would have been right around the time when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. It would correspond right around that same period of time. And you'll notice there that Daniel, or Daniel says something here. He says, the word was revealed to Daniel, and uh, the word revealed emphasizes that this message had a divine origin. The idea there is it's been a mystery that has been uncovered there. So now Daniel has got insight into what is coming. And he also says that it was true. Notice what he says. And the word was true. And Daniel's emphasizing here the validity and the truthfulness and the accuracy of the message that he's received. And it involved, he says, a great conflict. He says, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict. Now, as we're going to see here, this emphasizes the nature of the message, and as we'll see here in a few moments, the difficulty and the challenge of Daniel actually receiving this message. And so it was a, a, a revelation of a great conflict, and Daniel, he says, understood it. In other words, Daniel had insight into its meaning um, and, and was able to comprehend what God was saying and what God was trying to communicate. Um, and uh, again, this comes about as an, an answer to his prayer, as we're going to see a couple in a couple of seconds. He says there um, in verse 2, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. In other words, Daniel says, I received this vision as the result of uh, having an extended time, three weeks worth of prayer and fasting. You notice there he talks about, I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my food, in my mouth. In other words, um, this was not a full fast where he didn't eat any food, but rather he, he didn't eat any meat or any delicacies. Uh, maybe he was eating vegetables or something along that line, but he had set aside 
aside this time specifically to inquire of God, to to find out what was going on, um, and and to and, and to put himself in a position where he was better to hear God. Uh, in fact, he says he did not even anoint himself. Now, when we look at that, we think of anoint as having a very religious uh, aspect, but most commentators here believe what he's meaning is when they were anointed, they kind of used that as a daily hygiene. Remember, they're living in a very hot kind of desert area, and so they would put this kind of oils on their skin to protect it, to moisturize it, that kind of stuff. It was just part of their daily hygiene. And so what Daniel's saying is, I set aside a lot of the normal activities of life, eating and anointing myself and kind of taking care of myself for the purpose of seeking God and praying about an issue and praying about a matter. Now, you'll notice there, in uh, he says in verse number four, on the 24th day of the first month, so in other words, this is cause current, uh, 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 this vision that he has occurred on the 24th day of the first month of the year, the Hebrew calendar year, which is the month of Nisan. This is the month where they would have celebrated on the 14th of that month, the Passover. And so this, this time would have just elapsed. And naturally, you can imagine that as the Passover was coming, Daniel, because he was very devout, would have spent some time really inquiring and seeking God and, and really praying about as they as he thought about the Passover which was a celebration of God's deliverance of the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt here's Daniel living with the captives who were in exile probably beginning to think about the return and when they would be allowed to come back from the exile and, and I think that marks uh, something important that we kind of miss sometimes in the modern church. Um, if you look at Israel's calendar, it was set up to have uh, periodic reminders of the people about their need to worship and to uh, set a time, time to inquire of God. So they had a weekly Sabbath meeting, but you know that throughout their calendar, they had different feasts that were to draw their attention to different aspects of the nature of God and to remember some of his great works, days like uh, Passover, days like atonement, other feasts that they would celebrate. Today in our modern church, we've gotten away from that. In fact, we almost look down on it. Really, since the days of the Reformation, uh, Protestants have had uh, sort of a uh, looked with dispersion towards some of the uh, calendar type things, the uh, um, the liturgical calendars that the Catholic Church used. Now, I'm not endorsing all of that, but I will say this: there is uh, something to be said for taking periodic times to just simply begin to seek God. I remember when I was pastoring in West Virginia, one of the things that we, we did there on several years was in the time leading up to Easter, we would, uh, we would encourage the church to spend the week before Easter, leading up to Easter, uh, to spend that time fasting and praying for an hour a day. Now, they would fast throughout the entire day and then set a one-hour period, whenever it was, just for the purpose of seeking and praying God. And I can look back at those and think that uh, some of the most amazing spiritual moments that I've ever had as a pastor happened during those times. That seems to be what Daniel is doing here. Right around this Passover time, Daniel has set that aside for the purpose of really inquiring and seeking of God. Now, you'll notice something else he says here in verse number uh, four. He says, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the river, that is the Tigris. So he's not in Babylon. He's outside of the city of ways. And, and of course, we have no idea exactly where he was at along the Tigris River. But, uh, but it looks like he has kind of withdrawn from his normal activities, uh, normal court life that Daniel would have experienced. And he sent the time apart to really begin to seek God. And so he's there beside the Tigris River. And notice what happens. 
I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a, a belt of fine gold of, uh, from Upaz around his, na- uh, his waist. His body was like burl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words uh, like the sound of a multitude. Now, so suddenly, as Daniel is praying and fasting here, out by the banks of the Tigris River, he has this incredible vision of a man before him. And just to kind of uh, note a couple of things here, he talks about the fact that he was dressed in white linen. And we'll see this very often uh, in Scripture when it's talking about people uh, that are in heaven, uh, for instance, in the book of Revelation, and and in other instances, the priest, for instance, would wear white linen clothing, and this was a symbol of purity, okay? Um, and so uh, he also has a golden belt around his waist, uh, which is a sign of great wealth and great power. Very often in those days, uh, kings and judges would wear this kind of a golden uh, embroidered belt around their waist. His body was like burl, which was a precious stone. Um, Different translations will translate this. We don't actually know exactly what kind of of, of gemstone he has in mind here. Uh, Sometimes it's translated as a burl, uh, uh, sometimes as topaz, chrysolite, we don't really know exactly uh, what, but it's a precious stone. Um, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and legs with burnished bronze, and, and his voice sounded like a multitude. So in other words, this is a very uh, majestic and incredible appearance. And um, now you'll notice here that the identity of the man is never given in the text. Um, there have been a number of suggestions about who this might be. Some have suggested that he's just a simple, this is an appearance of an angel, okay? Um, and there are some good reasons to believe that, and I'll show you later in the text. Um, in fact, I would probably lean towards that interpretation uh, to a certain extent. It's very difficult to know exactly who this is. Others have said that it was Gabriel. I don't believe it was Gabriel. And the reason for that is every time Gabriel appears in the scripture, we know his name. When he appeared to Zechariah, when he appeared to Daniel earlier, when he appears to uh, Elizabeth later on, uh, and Mary, we, we have a record that his name is Daniel. And he's never identified here as Daniel. And so because Daniel had already had an experience with Gabriel, I would think that he would name him if it was Gabriel that was appearing to him. Some people have suggested that this is a pre-incarnate revelation of Jesus. And uh, there are some very good reasons for that, because if you went to the book of Revelation chapter 1, the description of God in that passage, uh, or Christ, some people have interpreted that as Christ or God the Father, uh, that there is um, uh, there's a very similarity between those descriptions. The problem with that view is that this person is clearly inferior to God. He was sent uh, to Daniel, um, so that could be a problem, although we know that Jesus was sent by the Father from heaven, and himself, although he is by nature equal with God, you'll remember he willingly submits himself to the will of the Father, so that wouldn't be a very big problem. Uh, The biggest problem I have with this being Jesus is that, as we're going to see in a few moments, he actually needed help from another angel uh, in probably one of the stranger verses of the Bible. So hold on to that thought for a moment, um, and I'll show you why I think that this is probably an appearance of just a a run-of-the-mill regular old angel rather than Jesus. I'll show that to you in just a moment. But in Daniel chapter 10, verse 8, Notice what happens when Daniel sees this vision. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My uh, uh, my radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. 
Then I heard the sound of his words, and I heard the sound of his the sound of his words. I fell, and as I heard the word, sounds of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. Now you'll notice something. Daniel was able to see this man. But his companions were not. Now, his companions were struck by fear, and they were struck by this trembling, he says, which is a connotation for fear. But they were not able to see him. But Daniel was, and Daniel was able to hear his voice and hear the message. And again, uh, this is a really strong uh, appearance here. And as Daniel is having this encounter, he says his radiance was transformed. Not the angel, but Daniel himself. This kind of reminds me of when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and was in the presence of God, he was transformed. You remember, he would come down and, and the glory would be showing and reflecting off of his face. And so he hid himself with a veil. Um, when Jesus was uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration and in the presence of God, um, you remember his of, um, uh, countenance was, was transfigured as well. Here, Daniel was having a similar experience. Now, that may lead us to believe that this is a, a revelation of God himself, that this man that is standing before him is actually God. It could be that we draw that conclusion because of this, this transfiguration that happens in Daniel's countenance. But again, I'm going to show you a little bit of a problem with that view in just a moment. Verse number 10, notice what happens now. And, I, and behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. So Daniel has fallen over face down. Now the, the man helps him back to his feet. He's still trembling. He's still shaking because, wouldn't you, if, if you saw this incredible picture? Um, and so this is showing the absolute fear that is, is consuming Daniel at this moment. And notice what the man says. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly loved. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That that the, the first message out of this man's voice is that Daniel is greatly loved. He says, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have, become, I have come because of your words. In other words, the man says, Daniel, as soon as you opened your mouth and you began to pray, I was dispatched with the answer. Isn't that a wonderful truth? That when we come before God and we pray, that the moment we begin to pray, God sets things in motion to answer it. Here's an example of that, where Daniel now is receiving the answer to his prayer. Now, it is going to be in the form of an incredible vision. It is going to be with some words that we're going to honestly struggle to understand. But at the same time, it's comforting to know that when we pray, God moves in response to our prayer. That is a wonderful, wonderful biblical truth. But notice what happens, and here's where we get to the really difficult part of this passage. In verse 13, he says, he, he says in, the, in verse 12, and I have come because of your words. Verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Now, this is the place where I think we struggle if we think that this man is Jesus. Because Jesus possesses all power and all authority. And no one can stand in his way, right? And yet here, we have this man saying that for a period of time, he had been resisted by someone that he refers to as the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, if this was just any average ordinary person that was saying this, we would be tempted to interpret the king uh, or the prince of Persia, of the kingdom of Persia, as the king of Persia. But because of the supernatural nature of this man that is standing before Daniel, it leads us to believe that he's not talking about a human resisting him, but rather that this is some other angelic being. 
And this leads us to conclude, by the way, let me, let me get into something here for just a moment, that, that certain kingdoms and nations, maybe all kingdoms and nations, have um, angels that have been established over them. We know that's true for the nation of Israel because the Bible tells us that uh, um, um, in, um, in uh, um, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, here that is mentioned is sort of the uh, protector angel of the nation of Israel. Uh, let me go over here and just kind of show this to you. Go back to, to Daniel chapter 10 and look what he says here in verse number 21. And uh, he says, but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth, there is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. So he identifies Michael as this prince angel, this, this ruling angel over Israel. We'll see that same idea later on uh, here in chapter 12. Look over in chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. Now he's talking there about the nation of Israel. And so we look at this and we understand that Michael has been assigned with this um, position of, of watching over and, and, um, and protecting the Jewish people. Um, in Jude chapter 9, and then later on in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, we find that he is referred to as an archangel. And that would mean a uh, first or chief angel, as Michael. Here we have this man, this angelic being that is talking to Daniel. It says he has been resisted by the prince of Persia. And most Bible scholars agree that this is some angelic being that has been assigned over uh, this Persian kingdom. And he resists this man coming with the message to Daniel. So all of which we have here is a battle between two angels. This angel has been dispatched from God to bring a message to Daniel, but suddenly, you know, he's coming into this kingdom of Persia, and this angel comes out and meets him. And notice what it says. He withstood me for 21 days. There's a 21-day battle going on, but then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So we have a battle between angels that is happening here. Now you say, Pastor, what does all that mean? Well, it means there is a, a larger spiritual battle that is going on around us that we cannot see and cannot even fully or even barely comprehend um, that is affecting us. And we may not even recognize it. And Daniel here is given this, this sort of the, the, the veil has been pulled back and Daniel is getting a picture of what is going on. See, the physical world that we live in is only a part of this universe. There is a spiritual world that is even more real than the physical world and affects everything around us. And so we're seeing that being played out here. And that's about as far as I can go with that. I don't want to I can't tell you any more because that's all I know. Um, but um, notice what happens. Um, uh, he says, um, but Michael, one of the chief priests, princes came out to help me. For I was left there with the king of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. So the vision that we look at in chapter 11 and chapter 12 is going to be for days yet to come. These are not about Daniel's days, but he's looking towards the future. And look what he says. For the vision is for days to come. And when he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned and my, my face towards the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, and I said to him who, st who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. Daniel, as he receives this incredible vision, and again, it's the vision that's recorded in chapters 11 and 12, he is just almost overcome. It's painful for him. It has taken all of his strength because God is showing him something so incredible. And look what he says. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now, no strength remains me, and no breath is left in me. This has literally taken all of Daniel's strength and all of his, 
all of his uh, voice. He cannot even, he's speechless as, he, as, he, as this revelation comes. And then it says in verse 18, Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man, greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. In other words, he receives help. Uh, the angel strengthens him. He encourages him with his words. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. And so you'll notice what begins to happen now is the angel says, I'm going to tell you some things, Daniel, and I'm going to show these things. Um, these are about what's about to happen. And of course, we recognize when he talks here about the prince of Greece, um, he's talking about uh, uh, perhaps uh, the, the, the uh, fulfillment of these um, uh, these uh, prophecies in Alexander the Great, but I think he also is talking about this great spiritual conflict. Now, we're going to have to leave it there for right now, but we, this is the prelude to chapters 11 and chapter 12. Daniel is there along the banks of the Tigris River. This angel has come with this message. This is a message that has come with great conflict. It took 21 days for him to fight his way through to give this word to Daniel, and now he is about to give it. So that's where we'll pick it up next week in our Wednesday night Bible study. Thank you for tuning in.